You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. It's financially supported by 32 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ in a four-state area. You'll see their names at the end of our program today. Now we have three gospel preachers with us to serve as our panelists. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. We I'm would Arnold love to hear from you, our from Anna Church of Christ in Anna, Illinois. And I'm Jim Fon. I serve as one of the preachers and one of the elders for the Central Church of Christ in Paducah, Kentucky. Hello, I'm Jeff Scott. I work and worship with the Middleton Church of Christ in Middleton, Tennessee. We're grateful for each of these brethren taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Our first question today goes to Brother McAllister. The person says, could you please explain Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5? Brother McAllister. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5 reads, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now this is a portion of Ecclesiastes in Solomon's life where his disbelief is expressed. And for what it's worth, uh, he repents of that by the end of the book, as evidenced in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. But let's look at verse 5. The living know that they shall die. And this is a universally true statement, isn't it? People then knew they would die. We know today that there will come a day when we die. Uh, life does not continue forever. But the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9.5 is constantly used by false teachers to prove, at least in their minds, that the soul sleeps after death, that consciousness ends when the last breath is drawn. But that's not true. Luke 16 gives us a glimpse of the afterlife. And you may recall the account of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man lived a comfortable life of plenty, while Lazarus sat at his gate begging, begging for crumbs. Eventually, both men die, and Lazarus passes into Abraham's bosom, while the rich man passes into Tartarus. In verse 24, the rich man cries out for mercy, stating he is tormented by the flames. He feels the physical, the pain, rather, uh, that he is in. He experiences that. And so Abraham responds in the next verse that because of how each individual lived on earth, in this case, the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus is now comforted while the rich man is tormented. Now, does that sound to you like departed souls sleep after death? Recall that Lazarus was comforted. The rich man was in torment. He experienced that. And he also experienced the anguish knowing that his family would end up in the same place he was if they didn't change the way they were living. And so, we know that after the soul or after the, the individual dies, the soul does not sleep. It continues in the afterlife. And so they are not unaware of their surroundings. That's simply not true. So what does the phrase, the dead know not anything, really mean? Well, to answer that, we need to pay attention to uh, the often used phrase in this book, under the sun. It means on the earth. Look at its usage in verse 6. Their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now when you connect verses 5 and 6, the meaning becomes clear. The dead no longer have any connection with or knowledge of the affairs on this earth. Therefore, when a person dies, we try to comfort a loved one by, uh, by saying, well, they're in heaven looking down on you. But friends, I ask you, how could they be if the dead have no more portion in anything done under the sun, done on the earth? The Bible refutes the idea that there are, as the country song says, holes in the floor of heaven. The next phrase in verse 5, neither have they any more reward. Well, their time of probation is over, and therefore they can, can no 
they can have no further reward for having lived a righteous life. Neither can they be subject to any further punishment, because their fate is now sealed. Their probationary period in this life is over. And finally, for the memory of them is forgotten. It's the way of, of, of all people that when they die, they're remembered for a time, but over the course of the years, their memory fades as those who remember them also die. The most important thing for all living people is to live their lives on earth according to God's will so that they will live on forever in heaven. Thank you for this good question. Well, we're thankful for that good answer that you gave Brother McAllister, and we appreciate it so very much. Now, we have with us today Brother Jim Vaughn, and this is his first time to be with us on a Bible Answer, and we're grateful that he could be with us. His first question is as follows. I have a question about the passage in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35, about women speaking out in church. Should she sing? Should she answer questions in Bible class? If she should ask her husband when she goes home, what is the use of even going to church? We'll give that to you, Brother Vaughn. Thank you, and thank you for letting me be on the program for the first time. I hope it's not the last time after you get through with uh, hearing my answers to my questions. Let me, uh, let me begin this by presenting kind of a scenario. Let's suppose you were at a religious gathering of some kind, and the man speaking would say something like, I've got a message from God, and he starts comparing the husband-wife relationship to the relationship between Christ and the church. Now, how would he prove that that's a message from God? He would have you or me or whoever happened to be there turn to something like Ephesians chapter 5 where you find words to that effect. Put yourself back in the first century when there wasn't Ephesians 5 written yet, and somebody says, I have a message from God, how would he prove that he is speaking for God? This question first, from 1 first Corinthians chapter 15, or 13, uh, verses 34 and 35, I'll get it right in a minute, chapter 14, 34 and 35, here's how the verses read. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. My understanding of that particular verse, or those particular verses, is that it's in the context of something that existed in the first century where men had to prove somehow that they were in fact speaking for God. And you can do a lot of research and find this out for yourself, but the reason for spiritual gifts, the end of the book of Mark and many other places, we talk about the fact that the gifts were to confirm the Word. In an assembly like what we're talking about here, there were men who would speak in tongues, men who had a prophetic word by inspiration. They had something to prove, had to have something to prove that they were in fact speaking for God and so they had some of these gifts to, to prove that. I believe that we're talking about women who were married to those men, and so they would ask them at home what was going on, what this all meant. It's not talking about women not e being able to sing in present day assemblies because the pattern for New Testament worship involves all of us singing and pra praising God with our voices. It wouldn't have anything to do with her confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're not talking about a, a Bible class experience where she might ask a question. We're talking about a situation where women would have the opportunity to learn, to learn maybe from their husbands. There, there are some things that happen today that we need to consider and pay very close attention to. There are some things that uh, we want to make sure that we understand about what the Bible teaches about the role of women. And this is expanding the question, I know, quite a bit. But there's absolutely nothing in the Bible that says contrary to what some people think, that women who are Christians play some sort of second-class role in the church. To be sure, there are things that the Bible says they cannot do. Preachers are taught to speak with all authority. Uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, women are taught not to teach or to usurp authority over the man. Now, I understand that some people play on that word usurp, or they concentrate on that word usurp, and so if I, as a preacher, or I as an elder 
would say to some woman, why don't you preach this morning? She wouldn't be usurping authority according to that definition of the word. But I think if you do a little research, it just means to have authority. There's always been a pattern in the Bible of male spiritual leadership. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what's going on here is a continuation of that, where the men are supposed to take the lead in the church, in the assembly, in the home. Most of us who are honest with ourselves, most elders, most preachers, most Christians, if we're really honest with ourselves, we take a look at our local congregations and say, you know, the real strength of this congregation may be in part due to who's in the pulpit, who serves as elders, who the deacons are, but it also may be those good, godly women with a servant heart who don't have their name in the bulletin a lot, they're not in the spotlight, they don't have an official title, but this congregation would not be what it is without good, honest, dedicated, faithful women. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you, Brother Vaughn, for that good answer. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, Calling on the Name of the Lord. If you'd like this tract on Calling on the Name of the Lord, or if you'd like to receive our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, you're looking there at one of our lessons, we'll send you eight lessons consecutively as you complete them and studying them along with your Bible. If you'd like any of our free materials, they're absolutely free, just let us know. You can contact us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. You may call our toll-free number, and let me warn you, because someone did this just the other day, if you call our toll-free number and get our answering machine, and you ask for uh, our tracks or information, you've got to leave your address or we cannot get them to you. Someone did this just the other day, I want this and this, and they didn't give us our, their address, and so we can't send them to you. And if that was you and you're listening, please call us back and give us your address. So call our toll-free number at 1-800-436-0463. We're also focusing upon our web address. You're looking there at our website, www.abibleanswertv.com. All of our past programs of A Bible Answer are archived there on the web where anyone across the world can view them at any time. We also have a YouTube channel, A Bible Answer TV. So you can search that on YouTube and find that and you'll find all of our past programs there along with the questions that are answered on each particular program. We hope you'll do that. Now back to our questions today. For Brother Scott's first question, we have this one. Is it appropriate to have at the beginning of the Lord's Supper communion meditations or what are sometimes called table talks? Brother Scott. Well, this is a very interesting question and you know, as we think about the Lord's Supper, what a special sacred moment it is each Lord's Day when we are able to gather together and partake of the Lord's Supper. It is without doubt a time of reverence. It should never be taken lightly. Jesus Himself is the one who instituted the Lord's Supper, that memorial to His memory, to His death, to His burial. In Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And then we learn a little more from Acts 20, verses 6 and 7. Paul waited in Troas seven days, even though he was hasting to Jerusalem, we're told later in that chapter, so that he could be with the brethren on the first day of the week to preach to them, to worship with them, to partake of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 29, Paul wrote, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. While many things are stated throughout the New Testament concerning the Lord's Supper and the when and the how, uh, you won't be able to turn to a verse that tells us about communion meditations or table talks. Uh, that verse just does not exist. The overwhelming majority of those table talks uh, that I have heard through the years uh, have been short, brief, and to the point, very appropriate for the uh, act of worship at hand. But we must always keep in mind during our worship to God that He desires all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. And I think we would all agree uh, that when it comes to the Lord's Supper, uh, as we're preparing to remember our Lord's suffering and, and His death on the cross, that that is definitely a time for that verse to apply in our lives. With that verse in mind, table talks may help visitors uh, who are present or younger people who are present uh, to understand what we're doing and to understand why we're doing it. It can help us gather our thoughts and even help center them on the cross of Christ. Uh, some even take that opportunity in a brief comment to remind us that the contribution that's usually taken up close to that time is a separate act of worship from the Lord's Supper. But we need to remember it's not a time for another sermon. It's not a time to be humorous. Uh, it's a very serious moment. There's much going on during the Lord's Supper. Uh, if we properly partake of the Lord's Supper, we have a lot going on in our hearts and in our minds. And we don't need anything, including table talks, to serve uh, as some kind of distraction at that moment in our worship. After all, when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're looking backward to our Lord's suffering and death. We're looking forward till He come again, as we read a moment ago. We're looking inward, examining ourselves. And then we're looking outward, proclaiming to others that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that He will come again to take us home. And so I hope these thoughts help answer uh, this very good question. Thank you for sending it in. Thank you. Now to Brother McAllister. A person asks, what does the Easter bunny and eggs have to do with the resurrection of Christ? Brother McAllister. Well, the short answer is nothing, not one thing. And I want to say for starters that, that no man knows with any certainty, none at all, when Christ was born. Now, we have an idea of when, but we don't know an exact date. We don't know when He was born. We, we don't know exactly when He died, not, not a calendar date. And furthermore, there is no command, example, or inference anywhere in the Scriptures that authorizes the celebration of the birth of Christ, Christmas, or uh, the resurrection of Christ, Easter. Nevertheless, Man has gone beyond the Bible's authority in celebrating both of these holidays as religious occasions. Now some will claim, well, the word Easter appears in the Bible, so God must approve of its observance. And part of that is true. The word Easter does appear in the King James Version of the Bible in Acts 12 and verse 4. And there the Bible says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now the Bible here is referring to Peter, whom Herod had arrested and was going to release him after Easter. The Greek word translated Easter in this verse is translated Passover, referring to the annual Jewish Passover, and all the other 28 places it appears in the King James Bible. The New King James Version uses the word Passover in Acts 12 and verse 4. Why then is it translated Easter in the King James Version? I don't know why the translators of the King James Bible chose to use the word Easter in Acts 12, 4. One possible explanation might be uh, that they chose to use the word Easter uh, so the English-speaking people of the early 17th century could relate it to their own calendar of events. That is, English readers would be more familiar with the time of year in which Easter fell than they would be the time of the Passover, when it was observed. This way they would more readily know the time of year that Herod intended to deliver Peter to the people. After the Jewish Passover, or as most of the religious world observed, Easter Sunday. So, how did the Easter Bunny and colored eggs come to be associated with the man-made celebration of the resurrection of Christ? Barbara Mickelson of Snopes.com credited the Easter Bunny with a German origin. She writes, 
he shows up in 16th century literature as a deliverer of eggs, in his own way a springtime St. Nicholas bent on rewarding the good. Mickelson adds, colored eggs were left only for well-behaved good children. As Christianity spread, the egg was adopted as a symbol of Christ's resurrection from the tomb, a hard casket from which new life will emerge. In keeping with that idea, the Easter bunny is a symbol of fertility in the spring, when flowers and trees are in bloom and nature comes to life after the dormancy of winter. So the truth is, Easter eggs and, and Peter Cottontail have no direct connection at all with the resurrection of Christ, but have, have been imported from the mind of man to the man-made celebration of that event known as Easter. I appreciate this good question and pray that I've given it a Bible answer. Thank you. Now to Brother Vaughn. What does the word spiritual really mean, Brother Vaughn? Some of us may be familiar with a man by the name of W.E. Vine. If you study the Bible, uh, you may look up some things in a work that he, pro he produced some time ago. It's helpful for people like me who don't know a whole lot about the Greek language, who are not Greek scholars, you just look up the English word and he tells you what the various Greek words were that were translated into that English word. And so I looked up the word spiritual in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. That's a long title, but that's what his work is called. And here's his definition of spiritual. Things that have their origin with God and which therefore are in harmony with his character and his law as his law is, rather, are spiritual. They're in harmony with his character, and his law is in harmony with his character, and so those things are spiritual. I looked through the New Testament, and I found the word spiritual used a lot of different ways. I've heard of spiritual gifts. I read of spiritual body, the resurrected body. I've heard of a spiritual house, the church, not the church building, but those of us who compose the New Testament church. There are spiritual sacrifices, there are spiritual blessings. Here are some things I didn't find in my New Testament. I challenge you to look in your New Testament. I didn't find anything about spiritual demonstrations. You know, the last question I dealt with had to do with 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and some things going on there. And as one of the other brethren pointed out, the, the rule was to let things be done decently and in order. And Paul was by inspiration helping that to happen by giving them some instructions on how to properly worship God. I didn't read about in my uh, reading of the New Testament about some kind of spiritual demonstration or any kind of spiritual atmosphere or spiritual feeling. I used to be a part of a religious group when I was a young boy and into very early adulthood that would partake of the Lord's Supper on a Wednesday night once a quarter. Now that's another discussion. The New Testament pattern is the first day of the week, but once a quarter on a Wednesday night we would take the Lord's Supper and they would dim the lights and they would light the candles and do various things and I suppose the idea was to make the atmosphere, the feeling more spiritual. Spiritual is keeping God's will. Here's the verse that really challenges me about spiritual. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, I read these words, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. As I said earlier, I'm an elder, I'm a preacher. It doesn't say anything about elders and preachers. If I'm spiritual, if I'm doing the will of God, Part of the will of God is that He doesn't want any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. I'm trying to reclaim that person. So my understanding of spiritual is not about how charismatic I may or may not be, how dramatic I may or may not be. It's how I humbly submit to God's will and try to carry it out in my life. I appreciate so much the question. Thank you to Brother McAllister and Brother Vaughn and Brother Scott for doing such a great job in answering your questions today. We've had some great questions. We've had some good answers, and we appreciate very much the good job that they have done. We want to invite you to the 2015 Summer Sermon Series at the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville. The dates of that are June the 21st through the 24th. 
2015. The theme this year will be bring your faith into focus. Bring your faith into focus. Our speakers will be Gerald Cowan from Marion, Illinois, Bobby Odell from Dover, Tennessee, Travis Quatermus from Dexter, Missouri, Victor Eskew from Paris, Tennessee, and then Brother Kevin Moore from Henderson, Tennessee. They've got some great topics on this theme, Bring Your Faith Into Focus. Each evening, the time will be at 7 o'clock. So we want to invite you to come out and worship with us and study with us the Central Church of Christ for our 2015 Summer Sermon Series. I was thinking about this last great question that Brother Vaughn just answered. You know, there are a lot of people that have uh, different ideas uh, concerning what spiritual means, and he touched on a lot of those. There have been those over the years that uh, thought that a monastic lifestyle, that was what made you spiritual. Or maybe asceticism, that's what made you spiritual. Or having spiritual gifts, they believe that's what makes you spiritual. Or maybe mere morality. And uh, with some, as he alluded to, just raw emotionalism. I was thinking about Romans chapter 8 and the first few verses of that great chapter. In Romans 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That verse shows us that the person who is in Christ is spiritual. And then in the next verse he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Could we not say that the person who is free from sin is spiritual? Certainly so. And then down in verses 5 and 6, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, the person who minds the things of the Spirit is spiritual. Now we ask you today, are you in Christ? Are you free from sin? Are you minding the things of the Spirit? If you are, then you're spiritual. These points from Romans and others which he gave help us to see what real spirituality is. Do you have a close relationship with God? Paul spoke of those whose I am and whom also I serve in Acts 27, 23. Can you say that today? Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.